Hey, we've got news for you, and it'll be very exciting when you see it. We're going to be talking about this thing called Preemption Line today. What is that? Where did it come from? And why is it so important for the history of the state of the greater Western New York region? I'm sorry. This is the state of greater Western New York report, and the line's important for the greater Western New York region. We'll be hearing all about that today, and I'll share with you some news that just came across the wire Okay, maybe two weeks ago, but that's okay. It's new to you, and you'll be enjoyed. Uh, to, you'll enjoy hearing about it. So let's start off by saying this show is brought to you as always by. Each week, our community makes history. Each week, you make history, and each week, there's only one source to turn to for the first take on history. You know what that is? Subscribe to the Sentinel right now to discover the history being made in your own backyard. The Benin Honeyly Falls Lima Sentinel. More than just your news, it's your history. Welcome everyone to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Hey there, and welcome again to a new year. and We've got new and exciting things, and let's start right off with this hot off the presses sort of thing. This is from the Congressional Record. The Congressional Record of December 15th, 2022. Read into the record by none other than Congressman Joe Sempolinski, who has been a multiple uh, guest on this show, and you've all enjoyed him. Well, what did he say in this congressional record? Well, you'd be happy to know that he honored the Treaty of Hartford, the anniversary of the Treaty of Hartford, which occurred on December 16th, 1786, and which many point as the birthday of the state of the greater Western New York region. What did the Treaty of Hartford do? How did it have importance? What line did it create? We're going to be talking all about that on today's State of Greater Western New York report with our guest, none other than John Marks. He's a curator at Historic Geneva. John, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got to where you are right now? Sure, Chris. Uh, I was born in Penyan, New York, which is just my house was just a few miles from the old preemption line, which we'll be getting into. Uh, raised by school teachers, uh, indoctrinated with all kinds of history from a very young age. In uh, 1993, I got a master's degree from the Cooperstown Graduate Program in History Museum Studies, and I have been back in Geneva since August of 2000. Excellent. Now it's it's this this idea, and and if you don't mind. You can plug uh, uh, John's book, the other John, uh, because this is really how I how I came upon this story. And he was a bit reluctant to be on the show. He said that you would do a much better job, uh, and and you are well well versed in this. And, and folks in the in the off screen stuff that we had in leading up to this, John Marks really knows a lot about this stuff, and and it's it's really interesting. So tell us a little bit about the Treaty of Hartford and how it all started what what caused this conflict between the states of new york and massachusetts well after the revolution everyone was strapped for money uh individuals but also the states as well and massachusetts uh the big thing was to sell land currency was fluctuating but uh, land was a hard currency so massachusetts looked at its uh, original land grant from the 1600s, which the King of England uh, granted to the various colonies. And you can see there, Massachusetts had north and south borders, but originally there was no western border in the grant. So they looked at that and said, oh, well, our, uh, and the grant said that the border extended, ex extended until the next ocean. So they said, oh, well, it looks like we own western New York. So yeah, the, uh, was... the this was this was just one of many claims, and I put up the uh, the Western New York map in the background there, so you can see what 
what mm -hmm. we're really talking about. You might notice that eastern portion, it's a bit jagged, and it didn't start out that way. But let's go back to this conflict that uh, the various states were having. Massachusetts and New York weren't the only states that had problems. Uh, go ahead and, and explain what, what we see here. Sure. Uh, Connecticut did the same thing right there below Massachusetts. And perhaps the most famous uh, dispute or claim from Connecticut still lives on in uh, uh, Ohio, in the Cleveland area. If you've ever been to Cleveland or have heard of what the Western Reserve of Ohio or Case Western Reserve U University, that's where the name com comes from. And as you can see there, there are a number of other claims as well. They claim part of Long Island in the colonial days, as well as down into uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, which was resolved uh, after the revolution. And it's it's this idea that Connecticut was going across and Massachusetts was going across. Really, did the kings of England, do you have any idea what the kings of England were thinking of when they did this? Or were, did they just, hey, this sounds good? Or, or were they just listening to the people who were claiming rights for the colonies? Yeah, it's, it's, really, hard, it's really hard to say what were the... the uh, exploration and the map making of the day. Yeah, uh, so so it's uh, it's one thing to to have this kind of issue going on, and it's another thing to start to resolve it. So we're talking now post revolutionary war. Some of these issues with Connecticut in, in outside of New York State got resolved, I think, before the revolutionary war, but the Massachusetts issue didn't. So how did they go about resolving it? And, and mind you, at this point, we don't have the current U.S. Constitution. We're, we're operating under the Articles of Confederation. And if you remember, audience, anything about the Articles of Confederation, they're all messed up. There was really no federal authority like we have today with the current Constitution. So states were doing things on their own. Whether or not it was legal, that's another question. What did what did New York and Massachusetts start to do, John, uh, to resolve this? Yeah, so in 1784, Massachusetts brought up this claim again. As we've said, they knew about uh, this for quite a while. So they brought it up and it kicked around for quite a while. It went to Congress in 1784. Uh, Congress didn't want to touch it. They said, take it to you know the federal court, which as you pointed out, was still in its infancy. And this went on for about two years until um, 1786, when uh, the two representatives of the uh, representatives of the two states sat down in Hartford, Connecticut, and they said, "We are going to run a line of preemption due north from the 82nd milestone on the Pennsylvania New York state line, 82 miles west of the Delaware River, where the Delaware River crosses the uh, state line." And you can see that down uh, in the corner. You know, we've got a nice straight border and then where it starts to squiggle a little bit, that was the Delaware River and they marked off uh, 82 miles uh, to the west, which would be right below Seneca Lake. And you can still find the 82nd uh, milestone uh, uh, there today. And the idea was that they would uh, draw a line due north to Lake, Lake Ontario and from looking at maps, everyone just figured that would go through part of Seneca Lake. And um, of course, the big question, you know, we can see here in a 1794 map from about where the Tioga River is, uh, everyone just assumed that this would go, go due north. Um, the big question, uh, the question I had in my childhood riding on Preemption Road is, what's a preemption? And Really, it just means uh, first dibs. Uh, if you remember back to your childhood days, you know, I dibs this, I dibs that. Uh, the official definition is the right to purchase something, especially government owned land before others, acquisition or appropriation of something beforehand. So the deal was that uh, everything west of this line, uh, Massachusetts had the preemptive right to uh, sell to uh, land investors after, of course, they cleared the title with the, um, uh, uh, with the, with the nations, particularly uh, the Seneca Indian nation. And after the land was sold, New York State would receive sovereignty, uh, the long-term benefits of uh, ownership, 
uh, particularly in the form of taxes. So that's why we are residents of New York and not Massachusetts, and they get all our tax money. So who, uh, so once this treaty is signed, then Massachusetts gets to sell the rights to negotiate with primarily, like you said, the Seneca tribe. What happens next? Who gets involved in this negotiation process and how does it go? Yeah, so obviously um, Pennsylvania doesn't want to get involved in all the nuts and bolts of uh, doing this themselves. So uh, uh, groups of investors go before the uh, uh, Massachusetts state legislature and there's a number of competing groups and what it boils down to is uh, the group that uh, gets the rights is headed by Oliver Phelps and Nathaniel Gorham, who are the two main uh, main investors and their names are the ones that have lived on in Western New York history. So on March 31st, 1788, uh, Massachusetts uh, passes the legislation that uh, they will sell Phelps and Gorham uh, 6 million acres in Western New York state. And this is kind of like a reverse lottery ticket. They're getting the chance to make money. They're not actually winning the money yet. So uh, the terms of the agreement are that uh, Phelps and Gorham have to pay Massachusetts $1 million in depreciated Massachusetts currency. They have to pay it in three annual installments plus interest beginning in 1789. So they had one year to start making payments. And of course, first they have to clear the Indian title to the land uh, before they can offer the property for sale. And then they have to survey the preemption line and all the interior townships, which you can see here. So the, the interesting thing about this is concurrent to what's going on with Phelps and Gorm, there, and this is a different story, but I just think that chronologically it's important to bring this up. There was an attempt by British and Seneca, primarily Seneca uh, uh, individuals, as well as some loyalists who still lived in the greater Western New York region there were some settlers at this time, primarily in like Geneva and Canandaigua. There was this effort to create a new state, to make Western New York an independent state, similar to the way the Eastern portion of New York County became its own independent Republic, eventually the state of Vermont. They, they were suggesting to do the same thing with the Western portion. At this point in American history, the Western edge of New York state was still in dispute between the British and the Americans. That wouldn't be resolved until 1812. But you have this going on. It eventually failed. It failed. This, this effort to become a separate state failed. At the same time, and John, I don't know if you uh, have any comments about this. There was also an attempt to lease the land. And that was done without going through Massachusetts. So it was directly through, I believe, these British supported uh, individuals to the Seneca tribe to attempt to lease the land directly from them. Do you wanna share anything you might know about that or, or how are we doing on time here? What, what are your thoughts? Um, absolutely, this group became called the lessees because uh, they found a loophole. The uh, Hartford Agreement said that only the two states could negotiate with, uh, with the native nations uh, to purchase land. So they said, well, we're not going to purchase the land. We're just going to lease it for 999 years. And that's what they did. They made an agreement with uh, uh, with the nations and uh, we're going to rent the land for 2000 Spanish mill dollars uh, uh, each year. So they immediately turned around and began, and sell, began selling uh, subleases. They never told uh, folks that they were selling them land. It's just like, well, we've leased this land and now we're uh, subletting it to you. So what, what year was this again? I, I can't remember. Uh, uh, 1787. So this occurred between uh, the time of the Hartford uh, Convention and when Massachusetts actually finally settled down in 1788 to sell the land to uh, Phelps and Gorham. So, and, and then what happened after they were going through this process? What ultimately made them stop doing this? Uh, New York Governor George Clinton in March of 1788 uh, put a stop to it and uh, declared uh, all uh, 
all leases and subleases uh, null and void and warned the uh, Haudenosaunee nations and Seneca that they were victims of fraud. Uh, understandably, this was not that much of concern to the uh, to the Native Americans. Uh, they were happy to take money from anyone and this was kind of more of a, a government problem to them. But uh, so anyone who had purchased land or sublet land from the lessees uh, lost what they had paid for. So we end up with a, uh, with a map that sort of looks like this. Uh, and you can see more clearly where, where this line is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that line in a second. But uh, John, we have a couple minutes before our break. Do you want to just sort of explain these, how these little land masses are broken up? Sure. So the um, uh, prior to the revolution, uh, New York State pretty much ended around uh, around Utica, as you can see there, around uh, Oneida Lake, and uh, the New York military track was set up and was actually being surveyed about concurrently with the uh, with the preemption uh, line and the Phelps and Gorham purchase uh, as a way of paying back all of the soldiers. Since again, you know, New York State didn't have a lot of money, neither did the federal government. So, as a way of paying back the uh, the military veterans from the revolution, uh, they uh, they awarded them land. So that was a separate uh, negotiation with the uh, Haudenosaunee nations to acquire title to that land. And now we're left with Phelps and Gorham purchasing this portion. The 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 essentially the eastern half of the Western New York region. And what did they have to do when you said they had to survey it out? What's the process for doing that? And I uh, I, I should mention real quick that uh, Phelps and Gorham had the right to uh, purchase 6 million acres. They went to negotiate with the Seneca and the Seneca said, absolutely not. So finally, what they did was they agreed roughly from this preemption line west to uh, about where the Genesee River is now. So uh, they had to have somebody come in, start at the 82nd mile marker and cut through the woods and else this was totally uncleared land and find a, a due north line to Lake Ontario, roughly coming out at about uh, the Sodus Bay. And the person that they selected to do that was none other than Colonel Hugh Maxwell, who was a Revolutionary War veteran uh, from Heath, Massachusetts, and he was a professional surveyor, and um, he had survey education and experience, but he also had uh, an unblemished reputation. They called him the Christian Patriot, so uh, everyone trusted him to do this correctly. And we will talk more about the process that he went through in creating this line when we come back. Uh, but first we're going to break away for a little bit of a commercial when I find out where I put it on this thing. <laughs> so, all right, we'll be right back after this message. Through the mists of time, nature and man have both created and buried treasures beyond the imagination. With the ages, these riches slowly dissolve into mere myths until they are forever forgotten. But there are those brave souls who tirelessly cling to the truth, ever seeking to discover the undiscovered, to reveal what has always been there, to uncover the hidden gems of a land thought forsaken but loved by millions. Fifty Hidden Gems of Greater Western New York. Discover the secrets in your own backyard. Buy your copy now at 50hiddengems.com. Welcome back. I'm with John Marks. He's the curator of Historical Geneva. He's telling us about 
the history of preemption line and what led up to it. We're at this point, and we had a question from the audience, John, about that image that I showed, and they wanted to know exactly what it was, and is it real, or is it just a picture that you had, or do you have the actual imagery itself? So can you explain what it is? I'll pop it up on the screen in a second. Yes, yeah, so, uh, yes, I thought that's what we were talking about. Uh, Historic Geneva has Hugh Maxwell's original field notes. Um, and uh, this this is an image of what we have. It was uh, paper sewn together with, uh, with thread. And uh, when it's folded over, it's probably about the size of an index card for people who remember those. Uh, it's about three by five when it's folded up. And he carried this in his pocket as he began uh, doing his survey. First, he ran a trial survey uh, while he was waiting for uh, Oliver Phelps to complete negotiations for the land. So he had some idea of where he was going. But it starts out at the 82nd mile mark. And as he's going along, he's writing about what he sees because surveyors were not just uh, doing the mathematical calculations. They were essentially uh, advanced men for real estate. So they would say what the land was like, what kind of trees were there, uh, where there was a strong brook running, because that's where you could set up a mill if you bought the land there. So we have his complete notes for uh, both the trial survey, the final survey, as well as when he started doing his uh, interior townships. So we should add that a lot of what we're talking about is John Robertella's book on preemption line, which just came out uh, late last year. Do you know where that's available? Is that available on Amazon or is that uh, just in the museum there uh, that they can get? This is a small get? run and he distributed it to uh, various historical societies in uh, Western New York. And we have uh, 10 copies here at Historic Geneva, uh, 543 South Main Street, Geneva, or through our website. And he's done an excellent job of not only transcribing these notes, because as you can see, they're pretty difficult to read, and he spent a lot of time uh, figuring them out. But he uh, he writes an excellent history of what was going on, what led up to this, and uh, you know, really, really the whole history of um, you know the survey. So take us through this process of Colonel Maxwell's uh, surveying. You know what what. How did he start? Uh, what end did he start in, and uh, how did he proceed going forward? And were there any sort of questions about anything while he was doing it, or, or did we, uh, yeah, that sort of thing? Yeah, there, uh, there certainly were. So he, um, uh, and I, I should mention that they were. Um, uh, he was headquartered in Geneva along with Oliver Phelps because you know they came out. Uh, west from Massachusetts, and they set up shop in Geneva because looking at an early map, they thought Geneva was going to be within the purchase. And at that time, it was already uh, a, a small frontier town, if you will. So he left Geneva and went down to the Pennsylvania border, found the 82nd milestone, and started heading north. And what you can read in the um, in John Robertella's trans transcription is. He does not mention allowing for uh, magnetic north variants, which back then everyone knew about it, the difference between true north and magnetic north. He does not mention this. Uh, later on, when he starts doing the interior townships, he does mention always allowing for magnetic north variants. So he doesn't say that he's done this. And to further muddy the waters, one of the lessees uh, that we mentioned before the break was in the surveying party. So there, uh, as we'll see, you know, uh, his, his line was wrong. Uh, sorry, no spoiler alerts, but uh, yes, his line was wrong. And there was this feeling that maybe the lessee in the party had tried to uh, steer the line in the wrong direction. So he just uh, started uh, really hacking his way north through all the, uh, uh, through all the underbrush and uh, when he did his trial survey, he got to Geneva and discovered that he was about two miles off from what he had intended. 
So I have a bunch of discrepancy pictures, John. If you want to yeah. tell me which ones to put up, I'll start off with number one. Yeah, if you one. want to start with the first one. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I should explain, this is from, uh, in addition to Maxwell's notes, we also have this linen map, which is about 35 feet long and maybe only 24 inches wide, that was done in 17, uh, the 1790s to finally resolve where the correct line was. So, uh, but it's great for our purposes because uh, you can see at the bottom, northern boundary of Pennsylvania, and it goes north. And if you look up at the top of this section where it says uh, 10 miles uh, or X miles, you can start to see um, there's a solid line and there's a dotted line uh, within that section. And already it's starting to veer. So if we look at uh, line map two, uh, by now it is really starting to widen uh, the, uh, the incorrect line on the uh, right hand is already going outside of that little strip that they, uh, that they made showing all the geographical uh, uh, features. So it's, you know, really heading west at this point. And if we can see the third line, uh, excuse me, the third, yep, discrepancy. Um, it's not just one, sometimes it's described as he just like went west. Um, as, you, as you can see uh, and saw in the uh, previous map, it was short little bursts. He'd be going, you know, in one direction for a little bit, and then suddenly he'd veer uh, for a mile or two, and then he'd straighten out. And by this point, he is, you know, really heading west. And if we can see the, the next map. Were there any topographical regions or reasons why this might have occurred? Or is it just he was off? <sighs> Not really sure, because if you look at the, um, I, I, I think those uh, hills and things that are described, I don't think it was any... Uh, less hilly or fewer obstacles off to um, off to the line that he took as opposed to the correct line in the middle. Um, it's really a mystery. So you, you can see he comes along here and uh, in the upper middle there, it says outlet of Crooked Lake, which is about where modern day Dresden is. And suddenly at that point, uh, it does seem to take a significant dog leg. Uh, suddenly it goes further west and then straightens out. And that was another point where people said, oh, well, you look at this and that, you know, some fraud must have occurred. Maybe he was paid off or maybe uh, Maxwell left and went back to Massachusetts. Maybe somebody else uh, did this. Um, he was there the whole time, as we can tell through his field notes. And it really wouldn't have mattered because he was already way off at this point anyway. So then if we see uh, uh, the next map, uh, up there at the top of Seneca Lake is uh, where, in the middle of the map, is where uh, Geneva was. And you can tell uh, from there to the center line, uh, that's where he was off by about two miles. And um, the only indication we have that he figured it out at this point was, uh, we also have his letters. And he, um, he, he wrote to his wife, he got to Geneva uh, on August 7th and he planned to just stay a day or two and then get back out in the field. And he did not until August 11th. And we have a letter to his wife. He wrote on August 9th, 1788. My dear, by disappointment, which happened to me this morning, I have not gone to the woods today. That's all he says. We don't know if his disappointment was somebody pointed out that he was like really wrong in his survey or what. Uh, but then you can tell pretty much from Geneva North to Sodus Bay, um, it was a straight line. If anything, it straightened out a little bit more to true north. Um, so, you know, it's it's one of the great mysteries and even having the, all these documents, we, we, we don't know. But uh, I speculate his disappointment was that, you know, his survey was just entirely wrong. Yeah. And... At what point did they actually discover that it was wrong? Did they suspect it from the beginning or, or you know, how, how did uh, they go about resolving it? Uh, yeah, every, everyone felt it was wrong. Uh, Phelps certainly did. Uh, as I say, the trial survey uh, was off at Geneva by about two miles. And Phelps learned this before he went to negotiate with the Seneca, uh, Seneca Nation. 
So at that point, he pretty much said, I wanted to have my headquarters in Geneva, but uh, I think we need to move it further west to Canandaigua, which is why Canandaigua became Ontario's county seat. Uh, but uh, several times in uh, the summer of 1788, he uh, he mentioned, I, I don't think, th I feel the line is right, not right. I, I just don't think it's correct. I imagine he didn't fight it at that point because he, at that point, he had less than a year to start selling land and paying off uh, Massachusetts, which ultimately uh, Phelps and Gorham were not able to do. So then uh, the land changed hands. It went back to Massachusetts. They sold it to Robert Morris uh, uh, briefly, and eventually he turned around and sold it to the Pulteney Associates from England. And at that point, uh, people said, you know, the, particularly the Pulteney Associates said, we want to know exactly what we own and what we don't own. And I think it was uh, in the early 1790s, maybe 1792, I could be wrong. Uh, they hired another set of surveyors to redo the line. And 1796 was finally when uh, the New York State Legislature uh, up passed resolutions saying this is the one true line. So uh, we had a question. Were there any settlers in Geneva at the time that this occurred? Uh, yes, uh, th there were. It was, um, there's a gentleman named uh, Elard Jennings who had a uh, uh, log cabin in a tavern down on uh, the on the waterfront. Uh, there were traders and people coming through this area, certainly for furs and other resources. And uh, what with this land being totally up in the air, uh, there were people who just came and claimed land. And then of course they eventually had to deal with uh, the, the legal owners, but uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, Seneca occupation in this area uh, due to the Revolutionary War when um, the Clinton Sullivan cam campaign came through and um, effectively uh, pushed out uh, the Native Americans uh, to uh, towards Buffalo and West to uh, discourage, one might say, them from coming in on the side of the British during the uh, American Revolution. So let's go back to the people who are in Virginia, uh, Geneva at the time of this. If the line had been properly drawn initially and they were west of the line, so that that meant that they were now in this land that had the preemptive rights, they already, quote unquote, settled or owned the land and now they'd have to pay for something that they already thought they bought before or did they just settle there without buying it? Yeah, I don't know that there's a lot of documentation there. So with the uh, with the first line, they were uh, they were in New York State. So um, I don't know if there was any you know transactions or not. But then when uh, the correct line was uh, uh, was was drawn, then uh, they may have been uh, uh, they may have been put off the land. Uh, but the other problem that came up with the, with the two lines is there was a triangular piece of land between Maxwell's and the final survey uh, that was known as the Gore. And so suddenly there were people who uh, had been, you know, living in that section as part of New York State. And then, you know, the land was, uh, was actually owned by the Pulteney Associates and that created a problem. They were allowed to keep their land, but New York State had to compensate the Pulteney Associates with land in another part of New York State. So yeah, so we got a lot of complicating factors uh, involved with this. And this is only half the story, folks. The rest of it is, you know, what happened once the Holland Land Trust came in and the land was resurveyed and we have a, a new purchase, but that's that's a story for another time. John, I want to thank you for being part of today's show. You've been very, very informative. And if people are more interested in this, they can certainly uh, pick up the other John's book. Uh, and that's available at your location in Geneva and uh, elsewhere, I suppose. But uh, you, it's, it's just an incredible story. And I'm sure that there's more that could be told about it and other things surrounding this very early era of the greater Western New York region. I want to thank everybody who was uh, listening today and uh, you, you were 
a great audience. You had some pretty good questions. If you want to be a part of the live audience, then I encourage you to go to stateof.greaterwesternewyork.com. And there you can sign up for free and receive the free invitation to these meetings, which are sent out every Thursday right before the show airs. And you can watch it live, and that's the only way that you'll be able to ask questions of our guests. Now, of course, if you can't make it, if you're working during the day there and, and it's just not possible that you want to see it, it's always available on our site, stateof.greaterwestnewyork.com. Or if you like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel at 1.30 every Sunday, this is rebroadcast on those two platforms and you'll be notified when the broadcast starts. So you don't have to remember as long as you like the page and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again. Thanks again, John. Thanks again, everybody for listening. And uh, we'll be back next week with more fun and exciting news on the state of the greater Western New York region. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.